Our scripture reading today comes from chapter 24 in the Gospel of Luke. Hear now the word of God. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And they said to, and he said to them, What is this conversation that you were holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. And then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Two people walked from Jerusalem to Emmaus on the evening of the very first Easter. As they walked, they were joined by a stranger. Now these two, we might call them followers of Jesus, although as yet they did not understand the true nature of his mission. They thought that he was the Messiah. You might remember last week I mentioned God's promise to David that God would raise up an anointed king from David's line to rule over God's people and establish peace and justice. They had hoped that Jesus was this Messiah. But their hopes have been destroyed. Something happened. Jesus had been crucified. The Romans had killed him on a cross at the instigation of the religious leaders in Jerusalem. And so now these two had had to reassess their understanding of Jesus and so they put him into the only category they had left in their theological understanding that made any sense. And they considered him a prophet. As they said, Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Last week I preached about the one story of the Bible. And these faithful Jews knew that story, at least the Old Testament part of it. They were living the New Testament part of it, but they knew the story. It was their story. They had all the hopes and expectations that God's word had given them. And they had hoped that Jesus was the answer to those hopes and expectations. But one thing they knew, or thought they knew, the Messiah wouldn't suffer and die at the hands of the Romans. And so their hopes were disappointed. And they had to go back to waiting. But the stranger they had met on the road was not really a stranger. He was Jesus. Only they didn't recognize him. And I don't know why they didn't. Was it their psychological state that kept them from recognizing Jesus? Or is it that God gives us as much revelation as we can handle at any one time? And before they could understand the resurrection of Jesus, they had to get the story straight. 
they knew the story. They thought they understood it perfectly. But they had missed something. When they told Jesus that their hopes had been dashed, he said to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And they might have thought, what? We, we do believe all that the prophets have spoken. Every word of it. Of course we do. But Jesus went on. He said, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Now, they might have thought, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Why necessary? Christ is just a Greek word for Messiah. He said it's necessary for the Messiah to suffer and then enter his glory. And they would say, why necessary? Luke goes on to tell us, in beginning from Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Don't you wish you could have been part of that conversation? What an experience. Emmaus is about seven miles from Jerusalem, so assuming Jesus joined them fairly early in their walk, say after the first mile, there would have been six miles left. How long does it take to walk six miles? Maybe an hour and a half, two hours at the most? Imagine Jesus giving you an hour-long, one-on-one session about how to interpret Scripture. Don't you wonder what he said? Actually, we know what he said. We don't know the exact words, but we know what he said because it is preserved for us throughout the New Testament. All of the New Testament writers saw Jesus in the Old Testament. And you can't read a page in the New Testament without running into quotes, illusions, people, and events from the Old Testament. They read it that way because Jesus had taught them to read it that way. Jesus saw himself in the scriptures and he taught his followers to read scripture that way. And when Jesus read the scriptures, he saw himself. You remember his very, uh, the sermon that he preached, the first sermon in his hometown of Nazareth in the synagogue there. He took a scroll from the prophet Isaiah and he read a passage and he kept his sermon very short. He said, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You see what that means? Jesus knew who he was in part by reading the scriptures. When he read the scriptures, he saw himself there and he taught his followers to see him there as well. This is the final sermon in our September series on comfortable with scripture. I want you to understand the Bible and believe it. The first two sermons in this series were about why you can trust the Bible. And these last two have been about how to understand it. You wanna understand the Bible, you have to know two things. The Bible tells one story, that was the sermon last week, and the Bible is all about Jesus. That's the main idea today. The whole Bible is about Jesus. Not just the New Testament, the Old Testament as well. It speaks to him, it testifies to him, Now, if all you had was the Old Testament, you couldn't deduce Jesus from it. But you would have hopes and expectations, like those two, on the road to Emmaus. And once you knew the story of Jesus, you would recognize how it all fit together. And you would see him there, and you would see how God had prepared the way for Jesus, and how God had been working out a plan from the very beginning and how it all holds together. Before I do a terrible job explaining this, and I will do a terrible job explaining it today, let me answer a question that may be in your mind right now. Namely, why should you care about this? Obviously, if you were a first century Jew who lived and died by the Old Testament, you'd be excited to learn 
that Moses and the prophets speak of Jesus. But do 21st century Americans get as excited about this stuff? Does this set your heart racing? Probably not. But it should. You should care about this. You should get excited about this. And let me give you three reasons why. You know, the first is you need to know that God is faithful. If you're going to base your life on Jesus' teachings, if you are going to trust God when life is crushing you and nothing makes sense, you need to know that God is faithful. Now imagine if God had called a people for himself and he started with Abraham and he upped the ante with David and he sent the prophets and got everybody's hopes sky high. And then he said, ah, I'm tired of this. I'm going to go do something new. Wouldn't that call God's character into question? Of course it would. Jesus didn't show up out of nowhere. God was working out a plan and a purpose, unfolding it carefully and deliberately. And once you recognize how the Old Testament speaks of Jesus and you see him there, then you see how careful and deliberate God was. And you know he has a plan. He's in control. You can trust him. The second reason you should care about this is the Bible is God's word to you. You ought to understand it. Some Christians don't like the Old Testament. That's tragic. That's terribly tragic. And some say that in the Old Testament, God is mean, he's full of uh, wrath and judgment, but in the New Testament, he's nice, he's full of love and grace. If that's what you think, go back and read it again or read it for the first time because the New Testament is full of wrath. Jesus taught about hell and the Old Testament is full of grace. Why else would God choose the people he did? Why would he redeem his people over and over again? You know, if you don't cherish the Old Testament, you are missing out. You are forfeiting treasures. You're impoverishing your faith and your soul. Because the New Testament and the Old Testament have the same flavor and the same message. And the same God is unfolding the same plan throughout both of them. And if you don't recognize that, you, you've missed something critical. You know, the Bible is God's word to you, and you need to receive it as such and cherish it. And part of that means recognizing how the Old Testament bears witness to Jesus. The third reason you ought to care about this is you need to know Jesus. He's the Savior. He's the guy with the answers. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And if the Old Testament tells about him, if it explains about him, you can't afford to miss that. So you should care. And if you ask me, is this stuff more important than all that's going on in the world today? I would say yes. Because nations rise and fall, generations pass away, but the Word of God stands forever. And you can either build your life on the solid truth of God's Word, or you can put your hope in things that are here today and gone tomorrow. And that, that's up to you. But you should care about this. Okay, so what did Jesus say to the two on the road to Emmaus that day? 
How does the Old Testament speak of Jesus? Now, I said earlier that I was going to do a terrible job explaining this, and I will, because to be honest with you, the only way to do a decent job of it would take all day. And that assumes that you have a thorough knowledge of the Old Testament. Even on the walk to Emmaus, Jesus couldn't say all that could possibly be said, but he did say enough. I won't even be able to do that. All I can do is give you a taste. So here goes. How does the Old Testament speak of Jesus? Number one, the Old Testament tells the story that Jesus completes. I mentioned a moment ago that if all you had was the Old Testament, you wouldn't be able to deduce Jesus from it and know all that he said and did, but you would come away with high hopes and expectations. You would know that the problem is sin. You know that God called a people for himself, that he made them a great nation, Israel, that he redeemed them and promised to raise up an anointed king from David's line to establish peace and justice. You would know also that God's plan is as big as the whole world. God told Abraham, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So right from the very beginning, God's plan was as big as the whole world. He started really small with Abraham and then with Israel, but the plan was always as big as the whole world. And even the prophets say that. The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And you would know that God had promised a new covenant, and you would know that God had promised to establish perfect peace and justice. In other words, you would know a lot about God's plans and purposes. What you would not know is how God would accomplish that. The Old Testament is a story in search of a conclusion, a story looking for an ending. And it can't be just any ending. It has to be an appropriate ending. It has to be an ending that grows out of what came before and makes sense of it and ties it all together, an ending that fulfills all that, that came before it. Jesus completes the story. He is the son of Abraham through whom all the peoples of the earth are blessed. He is the son of David, the anointed king God has raised up to establish peace and justice. His blood seals the new covenant. He is the son of God who gave himself as the atoning sacrifice to deal with the problem of sin. He will return to make all things new. Do you see how it all fits together? The Old Testament isn't just backstory that you can learn if you like or ignore it if you want. No, the Bible tells one story. And Jesus is the climax of that story. He's the hero of the story. He makes sense of it all, and it all holds together in him. He completes the story, the Old Testament tell. The second way the Old Testament speaks of Jesus is the Old Testament proclaims the promises that Jesus fulfills. I mentioned some of these already, God's promise to Abraham, God's promise to David, the promise of a new covenant. There are many, many more. Let me give you just one example. The prophet Isaiah preached grace. Now, actually, he preached a message of judgment and grace. But when he preached grace, boy, was he over the top. He didn't just say, Okay, God is going to bring you back from exile, and he's going to settle you in your own land, and you're going to enjoy a limited measure of freedom and a decent level of peace and justice. People would have been thrilled with that. 
That's not what he said. That wasn't enough for God. Through the prophet Isaiah, God promised to establish everlasting peace, justice, and righteousness throughout the whole earth. Either Isaiah was the most notorious exaggerator in human history, or God had something epic planned. Isaiah spoke about a mysterious figure whom he called the servant. There are four songs about this servant in the book of Isaiah. The most famous is in Isaiah chapter 53. Let me read to you just a small part of that song. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Can you hear that? without thinking of Jesus? One Jewish man, when his college roommate showed him this passage, assumed that Christians had monkeyed with the translation in some way. So he went back and read it in his Hebrew Bible. And he was shocked to find that it's exactly the same. He couldn't believe it. So he wrote it down on a piece of paper and he went around showing it to some of his Jewish friends. And he asked them two questions. Who is this talking about and where does it come from? They all said, it's talking about Jesus, and it comes from the New Testament. They were half right. Isaiah said God would remove the sins of his people through the suffering and death of this servant of the Lord. Jesus fulfilled that promise. That's what happened on the cross. And, and we see that it was necessary. You know, remember when Jesus told the two on the road to Emmaus that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer. Why necessary? Because it was God's plan from the beginning. And he had promised and prophesied about it. And Jesus fulfilled that promise. And again, this is just one example. There are so, so many more. A third way the Old Testament speaks about Jesus is the Old Testament paints pictures that show us Jesus. The Old Testament paints pictures that show us Jesus. As God's plan unfolded, he revealed more and more of it to his people. And along the way, he placed events and things and people that would point toward Jesus, that would be examples, it would be illustrations to help us understand Jesus. Let me give you one example of this. It would be the temple and the sacrifices that were offered there. So God told Moses to build a tabernacle, which was just a tent that can be, a, a temple that can be moved because it's a tent. So why did God tell him to do that? What was the point of it? Well, the point is that God is holy and God's people sin. How can holy God dwell among a sinful people? Well, the answer was the tabernacle and later the temple in Jerusalem that was built on the same pattern. God could be close, but not too close. And God provided a way to deal with his people's sins. And the way of dealing with it was the sacrificial system. People would bring animals, a sheep, a goat, a bull, and the priests would, would spill the blood and they would burn the body on the altar. And the idea was substitutionary atonement that this lamb dies in place of the person who sinned. The person who sinned deserves death, 
but the lamb is going to die instead. The blood of the lamb will be shed instead of that person's own blood. And you might ask, well, how did that work? The answer is it didn't. The blood of sheep and goats never atoned for human sin. So why did God tell them to do that? Because it was a picture of Jesus. On the cross, Jesus was both the perfect sacrifice and the perfect priest. He offered himself as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. He died in our place so that we could be forgiven. And if you understand the Old Testament tabernacle and temple and the sacrifices that happened there, then you have a better understanding of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Without the, ten, the tabernacle and the temple, we would maybe not understand, at least not as well, a, a part of what Jesus did on the cross. So God put these things in place as a picture to help us understand Jesus. And again, this is just one example there are many, many more. And I'm sure that on that walk to Emmaus, Jesus shared some of these things with those two. Because Jesus knew about them. For example, he told the religious leaders in Jerusalem, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He wasn't talking about the building where they worked. He was talking about his body. When the two travelers and Jesus reached Emmaus, Jesus seemed to want to go on, but they persuaded him to come in and have dinner with them. And at dinner, Jesus took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. And suddenly, their eyes were open, and they recognized Jesus. And just as suddenly, in an instant, he was gone. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the road, as he opened the scriptures to us? I love that. What a beautiful way to describe their experience in words. While he opened the scriptures to us, as if the scriptures had been closed to them before. Now, they had read the scriptures, they knew the scriptures. And yet they had missed something. And once Jesus showed them how the scriptures were really about him, the scriptures were open to them in a new way. My fervent desire and prayer for you is that the scriptures will be open to you and you will meet Jesus there. The other thing I really love about that is when they said, did not our hearts burn within us? Have you ever experienced that? I have. When you're reading the Bible and you know that God is speaking to you and you know that what he's saying is true and it's important. It's such a wonderful feeling that you, you feel God, you, you just know that he's talking straight to you and that you are not going to be the same. And my prayer for you too is that you will have that experience, that God will ignite your heart with his word so that the only response you can give him is faith and love. Those two on the road to Emmaus certainly had a very special experience. But you know, Jesus still does that. Through his Holy Spirit, he comes to us, even if we're not aware whom we're dealing with. And he opens the scriptures to us, and he shows us himself there. And that changes everything. My prayer is he will open the scriptures to you, and you will find him there.